Uh, we finished talking about how to create a single amino acid. But remember, why do we even care about amino acids? Because you can put amino acids together to form proteins. Remember, a protein is just a whole string of amino acids. Remember that peptide is basically a synonym for a protein. Usually we use peptide for kind of a small protein, say, and protein for a big protein. But both proteins and peptides are just strings of amino acids. writing down um, the structure of this tripeptide. Let's just make sure that we know how to write the structure of a tripeptide. Let's write this out. either from lecture or from the other videos, you seem to have learned that material well, so we don't have to spend time on that. Now, the conventionally, are we going to put the amino end on the left or the carboxy end? Amino. 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 So I'll start with H2. Now, remember that in the main chain, the basic pattern for the main chain is nitrogen, alpha carbon, carboxy carbon. Nitrogen, alpha carbon, carboxy carbon. Nitrogen, alpha carbon, carboxy carbon. So I'll start by just writing in that main structure. Nitrogen, alpha carbon, carboxy carbon. Nitrogen, alpha carbon, carboxy carbon. So I put in the main structure here. I've done it three times because there's three amino acids. And then I put on the alpha carbons and put the side chain. Side chain for alanine is just, alanine is just a methyl group. For serine, that's what serine looks like. Yes. And then for valine, you said we have that V structure here. And here we have our carboxy end. So where does, where is the boundary between amino acids? Where does one amino acid stop and one amino acid start? To the right of the carboxy carbon or to the left of the amino. Good, that's important. So these are the boundaries between the amino acids. The boundary is between a carboxy carbon and the nitrogen, between the carboxy carbon and the nitrogen. So I would consider this an alanine carbon, but I would consider this a serine nitrogen. We would say that nit this nitrogen belongs to the serine, or came from the serine, but this carbon came from the alanine. That sometimes messes people up. So putting in the squiggles might help. Another way to put it is, what type of bond do we have here? Amide. An amide bond. So the bound, pardon? Or That's right. It's called a peptide bond here, but we know it's just an example of an amide bond. Peptide bonds are, am are amide bonds. Therefore, the boundary between the amino acids is the peptide bonds. If you wanted to draw the boundaries between amino acids, you would put the squiggle across the peptide bonds. Not to the side of the peptide bond, but across the peptide bond, between the, car the carboxy carbon and the nitrogen. Now, I'm calling this the carboxy carbon because it came from a carboxy. It's not a carboxy anymore, but it came from a carboxy. This is the only carboxy that's left over here. What type of functional group is this? Amine. An amine. Are amines nucleophiles? Yes. Yes, because they have a lone pair. 
So they want to do this. What type of functional group is this? An AMI. An AMI. AMIs are not nucleophiles. Remember from the other video series, why are AMIs not nucleophiles? They're not reactive. Why not? Why doesn't this nitrogen want to donate electrons like this nitrogen? Because it's FP2 hybrid, or because of resonance, that it's going to have some kind of double bond connected to the oxygen, so it doesn't have a pile or it does not have electrons to. Its electrons don't participate exactly. in. <laughs> You're getting closer. There is a resonance argument. There's another resonance structure that looks like this. We know this oxygen would tend to pull electrons towards it. The key is there's a resonance structure where this nitrogen has a positive charge. Well, things with positive charges are not good nucleophiles. That's the best explanation. There's a resonance structure where this nitrogen has a positive charge. I think you guys might have been getting confused about some of the aromatic rings that we talked about. But those are for aromatic side chains. So there's no aromaticity argument here. There's just a very simple argument. There's a resonance structure where the amide nitrogen has a positive charge, so it's neither nucleophilic nor basic. But there's no resonance structure where an amine nitrogen has a positive charge, so it is nucleophilic and basic. That turns out to be the key to understanding lots and lots of aspects of peptide chemistry. There's a huge difference between nitrogens that are buried in the peptide bonds and the nitrogen at the end terminus. And of course, we wouldn't really expect this to be a very good nucleophile. We don't think of carboxylic acids as nucleophiles. All right, now, um, let's see. What are we trying to learn how to do now? We're trying to learn, um, one of the big problems that chemists have, or biochemists have, is taking proteins and figuring out what they're made out of. We'd like to be able to figure out what proteins are made out of. That's one of the big jobs they have. But that's not very easy, because we can't just look at them like we can on the blackboard. Well, one thing we'd like to do is take it to pieces. We can take it to pieces and figure out what the components are. How can we just break this up into a whole bunch of different pieces? Hydrolysis. Yeah, we could use total acid hydrolysis, because we know that hydrolysis will hydrolyze all these amide bonds. And then there's good techniques for identifying the, the separated amino acids. Um, and in fact, I think it now is computerized, so the computer would tell you what the amino acids are. However, if we hydrolyzed this peptide, what would the computer tell us? It would tell us that we have serine, alanine, and valine. And it could tell us how many equivalents we have, but it, but it won't tell us what order they were in. So total acid hydrolysis only tells you what the components are, but not the order. So what we need to do now is what would be convenient is if we could break off one amino acid at a time and analyze that. If we could just break off one amino acid at a time, then we would tell what that is. And if we keep breaking them off from the end terminus, then we'll know what their order is as well. Well, that's the Edmund degradation. What does degradation mean? That's a very overdramatic name. But degradation here just means breaking down. We want to take a long polypeptide and break it down. But why is the Edmund degradation better than hydrolysis? Because hydrolysis breaks the whole thing into pieces, whereas Edmund degradation just splits off one amino acid at a time. And it turns out that it splits off the end terminus. Isothiocyanate. Looks like you can see where the word phenyl comes from. Uh, theo means sulfur, and we kind of have a cyanide SCF group going on here. Now we're going to see how this uh, allow is going to break off one amino acid at a time from the end terminus. Now, what is this nitrogen going to do? Is this nitrogen going to act like a nucleophile or an electrophile? Nucleophile. That puts it at the tail of an arrow. Where should I put the head of the arrow in the phenyl isothiocyanate? Who's the electrophilic atom? Carbon. That's right. There's a bunch of reasons why that's logical. What would be a reason why it's logical for that to be the electrophile? Because it's plus. 
There's resonant structures where this has a full positive charge. For example, you could do this and put a positive charge on the carbon, or maybe you could do this and put a positive charge on the carbon. And also, just by induction, this has a delta positive because it's attached to things that are more electronegative. So this, sign, uh, uh, this carbon is a good uh, nucleophile. Now, what would be, um, we have to make room for this. So how might we make room for this? Well, we have to move one of these pi bonds. Well, who would rather get the electrons, the nitrogen or the sulfur? Nitrogen. So we can do like this. This is going to be, again, pretty similar to, say, attack on carboxylic acid. Uh, well, no, not really. So uh, maybe it's going to be similar to this attack on aldehydes and ketones, in a way. 